In France, he's simply known by his initials, BHL, a philosopher, journalist, activist, and public intellectual, Bernard-Henri Lévy enjoys a level of media recognition reserved in the USA for athletes and rap stars. His interests have always been cosmopolitan and have never ignored the USA. He now dedicates himself to knowing even better les Américains. His new book, American Vertigo, uses nothing less than Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America as its blueprint. Canapé listens as BHL explains how it began. At the beginning, I, I declined. I thought that it was too, too heavy for me, that um, to go in the footsteps of Tocqueville was too much a um, uh, hard task. And, and I said no, and finally I did it. What did they, how did they convince me? Maybe the main line, the main quote from Colin Murphy was when I, when I told him that, I of course, I like the field, but I like battlefields. He told me, but America will soon become a battlefield too. Maybe this is what convinced me. I don't know. America remains a place of freedom. America remains the place in the world, one of the few, maybe the most, where one can achieve his life. Uh, go forward, uh, 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 try to make it, and, um, and, and often make it, because you are less than in Europe, um, drawn back uh, to, to, to the past, uh, to the roots, uh, to the bad and dark side of your um, nationhood. Uh, there is a spirit in America uh, which, is, uh, which fits well with the, the, the best of the people, uh, the best of the soul of the people who come here. I found a young woman, a waitress of a bar in Grand Junction, who was devastated by life, devastated by life. She had a, um, a daughter who had been raped at nine years old. She had a father who was destroyed by the work in the mines. She had a husband who was in nervous breakdown since uh, 15 years or 20 years. She had problems for joining the two bites, as we say in French, as uh, earning her life and the life of her family. And she was so courageous. She wanted to make it, and she did make it. And she was brave, and she was optimistic, and she did not resign. She did not put the arms down, she did not resign. This woman, waitress of Grand Junction, she taught me so, so much about courage, dignity, and American optimism. We have lessons to give each other uh, about the health system, about the medical care, about the power of the state. We have lessons to give to America, sure. But on the other hand, um, as far as um, the pattern of citizenship is concerned, the way of building a citizen, America has lessons to give to, to, to France. I had a meeting with, um, first of all, the place is named Dearborn. It's a real Arab place in America. Uh, you have uh, really like in a suburb in France. The difference is that after half an hour of conversation with a group of uh, responsible of the community, I discovered that when they said we, oui, we think that, we should do that, uh, we are afraid of, and so on. We did not mean we Arabs, but we Americans, even speaking of the war in Iraq. So there is a feeling of belongness. There is a feeling of, uh, of being American, which is, uh, which is very strong. I wrote this book for two reasons, for Europe, to try to give to European public um, a more real, more accurate, less mythic image of America. America is not this uh, imperialist, uh, bloodthirsty, uh, um, uh, diabolic, uh, devilish country you believe. This is one thing I wanted to do with American Vertigo. The other thing is to say to the American people, beware, be careful. You are sitting on a great legacy. 
you have a great, a huge, a marvelous democratic tradition. The world needs that. The world needs the American values, but you are spoiling them. You are spoiling them because of a bad administration, because you betray yourself sometimes, your own ideals, and so on. And you can, you should uh, do better in fighting against anti-Americanism. When award-winning French director Bertrand Tavernier set out to make a cop film in the early 1990s, he had an original idea. Why not consult a real cop? The result was L627, which was nominated for five César awards, including Best Screenplay. Michel Alexandre was the cop and the co-author of the screenplay. After 15 years of police work, he's now done more than 15 years of screen work, and he isn't finished yet. Carpe finds the flic on the scene in New York and interrogates him. J'ai été policier pendant pendant 16 ans à Paris. J'étais ce qu'on appelait le, le chef d'un groupe de répression du banditisme. Et puis euh, parallèlement, c'est vrai que j'ai fait beaucoup de radio. Je viens de la radio. J'ai produit des émissions de radio à l'époque où les radios libres sont devenues radio locale privée en France. Puis un jour, Tavernier m'a appelé. Bertrand Tavernier, qui est un grand réalisateur français, m'a dit :« Tu veux pas écrire un film pour moi ?» Je dis, mais moi, je ne sais pas écrire, je n'ai pas fait des, des études d'écriture, j'ai fait des études de pharmacie, bizarrement, avant de rentrer dans la police. Et puis, bah, je, bon, euh, je, je, je dis, je ne sais pas accorder, j'ai fait beaucoup de fautes d'orthographe, donc je ne suis pas littéraire, j'ai dit non. Tavernier a, a insisté deux fois, trois fois, et puis, bon, j'ai essayé, et puis ça a marché. C'est le, le plus grand des hasards. Et donc, je crois qu'au travers de l'LC 27, on a voulu faire un peu une radioscopie de la police, en tout cas de la police judiciaire, de la police en civil. Euh, alors, ce n'est pas un documentaire, bien qu'on nous a dit que c'est un documentaire, non, parce que tout était écrit, le scénario était écrit, le dialogue était écrit, il a été dit à la virgule près, ça c'était très important. Mais ceci dit, on a eu l'impression de, 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 de les, les gens ont eu l'impression, les spectateurs ont eu l'impression de faire de la police comme les policiers. Et c'est la première fois que les policiers eux-mêmes en France se sont reconnus dans un film de cinéma. Ils se sont dit, mais c'est ça notre vie. Ils étaient contents parce qu'on a montré enfin ce que c'était que le vrai travail de police. Alors que malheureusement, dans les séries policières ou dans les films français, c'est de la fiction. Donc ça n'a rien à voir avec la, la réalité. Et là, ben, finalement, les policiers ont dit, c'est magnifique, c'est ça notre travail. Et le seul qui n'a pas été content à l'époque, c'est le ministre de l'Intérieur, le ministre de la Police, qui n'était pas content parce que lui, il a découvert la police parce qu'il pensait que la police, c'était celle des films. À poil et à quatre pattes. <rire> Tiens ton zoom, le voilà. Hein tu vas pouvoir aller t'emplafonner la gueule avec. En masse. À grimper pour aller la chercher. Dans les taboutés, à mon avis, tu vas mettre un petit moment à redescendre. Hein. Non. non, mais vous avez vu ça Il n'y a plus de discipline, c'est le bordel. Puis qu'on prend des types qui ont le bac, hein, ils se croient tout permis. Je vais lui faire sa fête à ce petit con. Tu peux dire adieu à Dieu, la brigade Des années qui chèdent, tu vas te retrouver, t'entends j'ai une grande admiration pour les films américains, tout bêtement parce que j'ai appris le scénario en regardant les films américains. J'ai appris la dramaturgie parce que vous avez des vraies écoles où on apprend une dramaturgie par acte. Acte 1, acte 2, acte 3, avec des points de retournement entre chaque acte, ce qui n'existe pas en France. En France, on écrit. Alors ça peut des fois donner des très beaux films, des fois ça donne des films totalement à la française. On fait un peu n'importe quoi. Vous, c'est très structuré et pour moi qui étais un jeune, un jeune scénariste, un jeune auteur, ça m'a beaucoup appris. Et en particulier... Le film policier est très très bien fait, alors vous avez évidemment les moyens financiers euh, pour rendre l'atmosphère du film policier, la noirceur, les décors, euh, la lumière, la pluie. Bon, C'est vrai qu'en France, malheureusement, on fait des films souvent dix fois moins cher, et on a du mal à rendre l'atmosphère du polar. Voilà. Et c'est vrai que les Français ont une grande admiration pour le film policier, parce qu'il y a un espèce de décalage. Euh, D'abord, les lois ne sont pas les mêmes, euh, le, le héros n'est pas le même. Nous, en France, le, le policier, finalement, est assez triste, est assez plat, assez terne, et on a du mal à en faire un, un vrai héros. Et puis, 
il faut le dire, et ça je, je le vois à chaque fois que j'arrive aux états unis à New York, en France, on n'aime pas sa police, on n'aime pas le policier. Le policier est quelqu'un qui est craint, que, euh, un policier s'assoit à côté de vous à table, vous, le, le, le français se lève et va manger à notre table. Bon, alors qu'aux états unis on, on mange, le, le policier est aimé, euh, et, et, et pas que depuis le 11 septembre, avant aussi il était aimé, et je trouve ça fantastique. J'ai un rapport à la musique très fort, parce que d'abord j'ai commencé comme disque jockey, tout bêtement, en animant des soirées, puis après en effet par la radio. Et là je me tourne vers la comédie musicale, parce que c'est quelque chose que j'aime depuis très longtemps, ça ne date pas de, 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 de quelques, quelques mois. Et c'est vrai que j'ai proposé à un producteur canadien d'ailleurs, euh, de créer une comédie musicale pour la France, sur un thème, un thème urbain, et, et du coup je, je me rends tous les deux mois, tous les trois mois à New York pour voir toutes les comédies musicales, pour les voir et les revoir. Euh, je, je, je prends un exemple, Urinton, je l'ai lu 15 fois parce que à chaque fois on analyse, on regarde chaque comédien, le décor, les costumes, la lumière, c'est magnifique. Hier soir j'étais encore en train de voir Bombay Dreams, ce euh, n'est que la quatrième fois, je suis parti pour 15 fois. Voilà, et donc en tant que, que, que scénariste, parce que c'est vrai que maintenant je vais devenir réalisateur, mais en tant qu'auteur, en tant que scénariste, j'adorerais travailler ou coécrire avec, euh, avec quelqu'un d'autre sur un film américain parce que là on a les moyens. De, de nos ambitions, comme on dit, on a les moyens de faire quelque chose et, et ça me fascinerait de faire un, un, un film, soit tourné en France, soit tourné aux états unis mais en tout cas, travailler au moins une fois dans ma vie avec un cinéaste américain. Ça, ce serait peut-être le, le rêve de ma vie d'auteur français. Caribbean music is hot worldwide. There's son from Cuba, reggae from Jamaica, and merengue from the Dominican Republic. In the French Antilles, it's zouk. One of the bright stars in its firmament is Christiane Valjeau. She comes from a town known for its deep roots in Martinican culture, but also carries with her training in classical and jazz styles. The chanteuse talks with canapé and sings for our viewers. Oui, je suis venue à New York pour représenter la Martinique, déjà en Martinique Days, et puis me faire connaître aussi un peu plus sur les États-Unis. Le zout, c'est une musique qui se danse à deux. C'est très sensuel et euh, c est, c est, ça parle en général d'amour. Et euh, c'est une musique très lente qui se, lance, qui se danse à deux. Voilà. Donc c'est très bien pour les amoureux. Ça me fait plaisir parce que c'est la deuxième fois que je viens à New York et puis euh, euh, jouer euh, de la, du zouk devant des Martiniquais qui vivent euh, aux États-Unis depuis quelques temps, qui ne sont pas venus en Martinique. Euh, et puis il y a aussi un autre public euh, haïtien ou, ou des, des Américains qui aiment le zouk, qui viennent aussi découvrir le zouk. Donc c'est une bonne chose pour, pour le zouk. Writing a survey of French history requires more than a bit of research. For Oxford University Don, Alistair Horn, the research period has been a lifetime and more than 15 previous books. Written with unusual grace and argued with the authority of a scholar who never forgets his grateful reader, the single volume history La Belle France tells a story populated with artists, politicians, armies, and the French people themselves. From Julius Caesar in ancient times to Jacques Chirac in our times, the book offers a voice that weaves person and place, cause and event into history. Canapé listens to the Don's voice. My book, La Belle France, is a, 
culmination of really 40 years' work, a 40 years' love affair with France and the French that I've had. And uh, I, I wrote, it, wrote it fairly unashamedly from an Anglo-Saxon point of view as a, as a Brit. And uh, I wanted to call it Our Dear Enemies. The reason I was going to call it Our Dear Enemies is because I had a French friend who was a central casting general who looked like Hercule Poirot, uh, who would greet me every morning and say, Ah, mon cher enemy, my dear enemy. He explained, uh, we have been at war so many hundreds of years, but really we quite like you. I'm often questioned how I see France. For instance, what sex? Is France a man or a woman? Uh, I think there's no doubt that uh, Germany, for instance, is a man, and I suppose Britain, John Bull, is a man too. But France has to be a woman. After all, La Belle Marianne, the symbol of, of France, is this marvelous woman with her uh, jolie saint, her lovely bosoms uh, open to the wind. Um, uh, there is something very feminine about um, which, with the, all the most alluring things, and also some of the more difficult things that we associate with uh, feminine sex. Well, well I, I have a view that um, you can't write history in isolation. One of the most important factors of history is geography. Take the difference between my country, Britain, and the United States and France. We, up to recently, have been very safe countries. We've had the sea between us and, the, and our enemies. But France is the most vulnerable country, one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. If you, if you go to France, you'll see that huge tract of open, flat country, which I think explains part of it, why, part of this ferocity, why there's a sense, it's, it's you know, the other thing that um, uh, the best form of defense is offense. So you attack before they attack you. But the vulnerability is a very important part of, of uh, the history of France. Grande de la France has uh, uh, a close association with La Gloire. It's from La Gloire that you get Grandeur. It's from win this is the old notion of winning battles, winning wars, that you have Grandeur. Um, I think the, the French are more obsessed, and certainly since uh, in, in the last hundred years, with La Grandeur, La France. And of course, we naturally associate it with de Gaulle. De Gaulle had one or two great moments, which are really historic. One moment when, against American and British wishes, he entered Paris on August 26, 1944, took over the, the uh, prefecture and said, Ici, la France. I am France. I'm taking over. Now, if he hadn't, there could have been, uh, the whole country was in total disorder. The Germans were just leaving, and the communists were very strong. France could easily have... Uh, become a, a communist state or had a civil war in the way that the Greeks did. And then he, uh, when France was uh, absolutely torn apart by the Algerian War in 1958, he was persuaded to come back. And it was under, he definitely, uh, he created the modern France as we know today, the Fifth, Fifth Republic. Talking about French culture and the origins of, of uh, this uh, immense power that really we associate with of, of culture. Um, let's go to Mitterrand, fascinating character to me. He was a man of enormous culture. He actually wrote books. How many presidents or prime ministers uh, have written books? And he, he uh, supported the arts quite enormously. But the fact that he did it, I think, is illustrative. And it shows uh, a strand going right the way back to Eloise and Abelard. Who, uh, Abelard, the founder of the Sorbonne in, in the 11th century, where uh, uh, culture, uh, reading, books, uh, art were always a tremendously vital part of, of French life. It's this extraordinary feeling the French have a mission, the Mission Civilatrice, to actually, uh, well, not democratize the world, that's a modern context, but to, to bring culture to the world and which they have done over the years with enormous success. Restless in her relationship with the visual world, postmodern French artist Anne Delporte, who bases herself in Brooklyn, combines media to suggest the many shifting layers of our perception. As one admiring critic puts it, hidden iconic images appear from behind a whitewashed wall. Ethereal figures emerge from the scratched surfaces on glass, and the mundane becomes fantastic in the manipulated subjects of her photographic works, paintings, 
films, and videos. Canapé talks with the artist about her world. It's an exhibition made of um, tons of images, which are the most published image in the world because it's only images from the newspaper. Most of them come from the New York Times, few from the Village Voice, but very few. So I glue the whole, um, I cover the wall with newspaper, but over all the wall. And then I repaint on the top of the newspaper, leaving some uh, images that are in the newspapers. And the name of the, the show, which is copyright, is just because all these images that everybody has seen in the, in the newspaper has a copyright that I just do not respect at all. And it's in painting around and in isolating the, the, the photos that you make them appear. And it's like recovering, I mean covering photos that you make them appear. And the whole work is about uh, appearance and disappearance on images. In that case, we, we take the whole process, like from the time the, the wall is covered with, the, with new newspaper, then it has been, uh, we've, we were a lot of people like detouring some, uh, a lot of images. But then I spent mm, three days or more with a big brush just to get rid of some images to make these images floating and to give them a rhythm in the wall. And the blue color is the kind of the color of the sky, of course, but it's the only color that makes these images floating. It's not a color, it's more like um, the light. People have seen these images, of course, and they, it reminds them something, but they don't recognize the thing because they, the scale, like when they see something that looks like a Pollock painting, but which is not the size that they have seen it, they just don't recognize it. Plus, so there is the scale and there is the situation that all these images are surrounded by lines, which are the lines that frame every article, every review in the newspaper, so it's a new frame. And so people know, they know that they have seen these images, but they don't know what it is. And, but my whole work is based on that time lapse that you need to recognize what you are looking at. And in many different medias, in that case it's painting, but it can be video, it can be photos, and in each, in, with each series, it takes a different time lapse to realize what you're looking at, and it's a, basically it's a game. light is really coming from within the wall. And when I look at these images that I have done, I didn't know what to do with that. But because of this little bit spooky images, uh, it reminds me like the music that everybody knows. And at the same time, it's, I mean, like for everybody, it took me a long time to remember what it was. And finally, I found that it was the, um, the soundtrack of M. Le Modi, M. from Fritz Lang. And again, people recognize, I mean, they know that they have heard this music and it's part of the um, the memory of everybody, but they don't 
remember what it is, where it comes from, and so this is a game, a game with the memory and the time that you have, you need to just. What's in a name? You might think that a group called BBC Sound System would at least be British. You might not think that they're a Senegalese hip-hop group. Apparently, the African singers draw their name from the quality of sound that they make, not from the place where they make it. But as world music fans know, Senegal is a good place for music makers. The three members of the group create a sound that crisscrosses the Atlantic with grooves that unite the Sahara to the South Bronx. Canapé listens to the beat. Oh, Teresa. 